Hi, I'm Steve Wessling. I'm the Executive Director of SAMRI. Well, I actually didn't um, decide to do medicine. Um, I was very interested in science, but also actually interested in, in people and working with people. And so in year 12, I put medicine first because it seemed to combine that science stuff and but also seeing people and helping people and also opportunities to travel and uh, I was lucky enough to get a score that got me into medicine so um, that's when it started really yeah. So I guess there were a couple of influences. Um, the major one actually was uh, after I trained um, as a physician, I went to Papua New Guinea for a while and probably hadn't done much academic medicine up until that point. But my experience in PNG, particularly in Goroka in the Highlands, was the impact of research and science on healthcare and on the health of people in Papua New Guinea um, made me think that, you know, maybe a research career or a combination, a clinician scientist career was something that would be interesting and, and, and have an impact. There are a couple of difficulties, and they still exist actually. Um, one is that there isn't a defined career path and people, there's no job that pays you to develop into a clinician scientist. Um, and then there's a, quite a lot of time involved and also time where you might not be doing the things that your peers are doing. And so for instance, to be truly uh, successful in academic medicine, I think you have to do a PhD. You know, you've got to go back to being a student. I really enjoyed that, but you do have to go back and do that three, four years of being a student after, you know, being a doctor for some time. And I also think you need to have experience in other environments, which almost invariably means going overseas. So doing a postdoc, um, I was lucky enough to do my postdoc at Johns Hopkins. And so I learned a lot of science at Johns Hopkins, but I also learned about a, a really successful um, culture and an amazing teaching hospital. Well, I think there are probably two legacies. One's physical and the other's um, the existence of Samri. So firstly, I think, you know, we've been so lucky to be able to develop this building and now we're building Samri 2 next door. So hopefully when I leave, you know, there'll be this physical presence on this precinct um, of, Sa you know, Samri is the center of the precinct along with the universities and also the amazing new um, Royal Adelaide Hospital. So a physical legacy, but you know, buildings aren't what make medical research institutes. So it's then building the people within um, this building, you know, developing the culture of Samri. Um, and I guess that culture has, has, I think, had two really, two things that I'm really proud of. One is, uh, as John Shine once put, de translation is in our DNA. So we're very translational. It's all about moving what we do into healthcare. And the other comes from Alex Brown, one of our theme leaders, and he's the head of Aboriginal Health Equity and it's in the title of his theme, Health Equity. So Alex has really driven, and I've you know, been very proud in supporting this, but both Aboriginal health equity is at the centre of what we do, but health equity generally is at the centre of what we do. So, and I'm not sure that's always the case in research organisations, but it certainly is with us. And uh, I would like, you know, if I came back to Samri in 10 or 15 years time, Love to see the building still here, still full, full of people with a passion for research, but a passion for translating their research into outcomes that improve fairness and equity. Data, digital health, AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to have the biggest influence on health going forward. I think in the last 10 years, the biggest influence has been genomics, both in diagnosis and in the development of drugs and other things. But going forward, we have to make the health system sustainable. We need to have ways of, uh, of improving the health system, doing clinical trials, understanding um, the deficiencies in the health system really rapidly. 
And I think actually within SAMRI, we have some great examples of that. You know, the registries, our joint registry, our dialysis and transplant registry, and more recently, our aged care registry are all collecting data that can dramatically influence the health system immediately. And so I think data is gonna drive it. As soon as you have large amounts of data, and that could be health administrative data, but it also could be imaging data, genomics data, omics data, then you need obviously high performance computing, but that's not actually enough. You need AI and machine learning to utilize that data yeah. quickly and appropriately, and then to deliver the outcomes so that the decisions that clinicians, not only doctors, but all clinicians make, are influenced by the data. Well, I guess that there are two areas that I'd like to particularly concentrate on in rela relation to diversity, but I think diversity generally is important. One is gender equity in science, and that's a big issue um, at a funding level, at a career level, early career, mid, and particularly late career. And, uh, and so we've been really proud here at SAMRI to get our bronze award, our SAGE bronze award. If you don't, people don't know what that is, it means that we are measuring and improving gender equity in science actively. And we got that award a few weeks ago, so that was tremendous. Um, and the other thing that I think we are very, very proud of is, is in the Aboriginal health space. And we have our Aboriginal health equity theme. Within that theme, there's about 50 people, 30 are Indigenous. So 30 people in the one theme are Indigenous. And then across the building, we have about 35 Indigenous people uh, out of um, four or 500 people who are employed by SAMRI. Um, and so that it makes me very proud that we're building that capacity. A lot of them are very young uh, and still developing in their terms of their science. Um, but um, I think that's one of the most important things we're doing. Uh, a lot come fr from Adelaide and South Australia, but we also from all over Australia. And, you know, for instance, two of our most outstanding um, female Indigenous researchers are Torres Strait Islanders. Um, and so it's a, it's a really interesting group of people from all over Australia. Yeah. So I, you know, I do think it's really important, one, to look back and see what people have um, done in the past, what have their, been their particular strengths. Um, but ultimately, um, I think, and you can call it whatever you like, people skills, emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. those sort, the, the ability to work with people, um, the ability to read people, ability to um, work with, uh, difficult people, the ability to work in a team, that, they, those attributes are incredibly important. Because the, the impact someone has on you early in your career obviously <laughs> has a much bigger impact than someone later in your career. And so when I went to Papua New Guinea, there was a guy called Michael Alpers who actually came from South Australia. But he developed the, or was leading the Institute for Medical Research in Garoka. And he'd been, when I got there, I think he'd been there for about 15 years. Uh, subsequently, he stayed another 10. So he led that institute for 25 years and then retired. And the work that he did in th those, that environment in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, developing evidence around things, I mean, his biggest bit was on Kuru, I could explain that too if you want me to, but also on pneumococcal vaccines and a whole lot of other areas um, was just amazing and I thought, you know, that's the sort of research and evidence that dramatically changes health in that environment or around the world, yeah. yeah. He probably should have won a Nobel Prize, by the way, but really? um, the person he worked with was a guy called Carlton Gajasek on Kuru and Carlton won the Nobel Prize. and. I've always thought Michael should have shared that. What's Kuru? Kuru is a, it's similar to Creutzfeldt-Jakob or mad cow disease. So it's a prion disease of the brain that causes people to have very um, uh, funny movements and eventually um, dementia and they die. Um, and, um, and that happened in a particular region, the Foray region in the Highlands of New Guinea. 
Um, yes, yeah, so people do call it cannibalism. I call it, call it um, um, transumption, um, which really meant that when people died, the family prepared the body and did consume some of that body. But they didn't actually go and kill people and eat them, which right. is what cannibalism is. Right. They were relatives, and which is why for a long time they thought it was genetic, because basically the, the women and children prepared the body and then they had a very complex funeral process, but involved um, consumption of the body uh, or parts of the body. Yeah. And that's how the prion was transmitted. Yeah. So I think the most important thing is to do um, what you re do what you really want to or you're really passionate about. Because <clears throat> I often talk to younger clinicians in particular who say, well, I, you know, I can't do infectious diseases as an example because all the jobs are taken or I can't do cardiology or I can't go into global health because there's too many global health people. But actually, it's, firstly, it's very hard to predict where the jobs are and second, um, if you choose your job on the basis of whether you, you know, there's an opening, you're not going to be as, you're not going to be passionate about it. And, and the people who really succeed, the Ian Frasers of the world or Ingrid Schaefer's of the world, are doing things they love and therefore do them really well and become, you know, internationally renowned or uh, internationally significant or make a difference. Um, if you don't do that, then I, I think you're not going to have, uh, if you aspire to leadership, you're going to find it a lot harder.